Uh, last night in the NBA, what could have been a series clinching win right there in Madison Square Garden um, as uh, the Philadelphia 76ers scored seven points in the last 25 seconds of regulation. Tyrese Maxey finished with 46. And the Sixers came from behind in regulation to tie it and then came from behind in overtime to win it, end up getting a 112-106 win to extend their season. They trailed by six with 28 seconds to go. 28 seconds to go. Crazy, crazy stuff. But you know what's interesting? In baseball, in baseball. Baseball. Yes. At the end of games when closers blow a big lead, Almost always it begins with basically two ways. One is an error, or usually you walk the opening batter of the the first batter of an inning, right? Closer comes in, comes out of the pen. They got all the they got all the music and the flares and the fireworks going. He comes in and he's staring down. He's throwing gas. It's like 115 miles an hour. And ball four, take your base, and now all of a sudden everybody's everybody's um sphincters. Get tight. And then a series of events, sometimes an error, things that go bump in the night, maybe a bad call, leads to the comeback. Right? Go back and look, and everyone knows uh, a comeback or two in baseball that started that way. In basketball, and we talked about this going back to last week, when teams get wins, okay, when they pull off wins, oftentimes in comeback fashion, Oftentimes, or most times maybe, a missed free throw triggers it. Right? A missed free throw triggers it. It's it's just fascinating to see how how they mirror it. And then the other issue is do you foul when you're up three points late in a game? And I don't know, by now, if you're not in the you should foul under usually under seven seconds, you should foul, then I I can't really help you. Now the maxi three wasn't with seven or less. less uh, I, I think, did it go in with five to go? So it was kind of on the borderline, but Tom Thibodeau was, it looked like he was yelling to foul to Deuce McBride, who obviously did not hear him. And uh, the rest, as they say, is, is history. Here's Tom Thibodeau trying to explain the end of the game. Tough way to lose a ball game. We had a lead. Um, we got to play tougher with the lead. We fouled in a situation that we didn't want to foul in. And then in uh, the, end, the end, Max makes a big shot. So, you know, we got to do better. Got to do better. Uh, Maxi made seven of those big shots. The lead he's talking about was they had a they had that six-point lead. Out of a timeout, Maxi shot fakes, hits a three, and gets fouled by Mitchell Robinson. Now, here's where I would, Tom Thibodeau was right to yell to foul. Where he's wrong is when Josh Hart missed the first free throw, first of two. And Josh Hart had 18, nine rebounds, four assists. Couldn't have been any better except for shooting the ball. But that first missed free throw, if you watch the game, it barely hit rim. He was tight. And for a guy who's won a national championship and played almost a decade in the NBA, that's really interesting for him to be that tight in that spot. It, you close out the series if you make both free throws. It's a four-point game. It becomes not impossible, but seemingly virtually impossible, just like we said. Now, you could point out that the actual run began on the shot fake, four-point play, Maxi makes the three. That would be fair. But kind of go through the sequence of events. Right? You come out of a timeout, you're up six points. The only way you lose is if they cut the possessions from three to two, right? The only way you lose is if you cut the possessions from three to two. Because there's just not the time on the clock. If they score a dead layup five five seconds, you still they have to have two more possessions. And then you're likely going to get fouled and you can make it a three possession game. The only way you lose is the way in which the Knicks lost the game. 
you cannot not only give up a three-point shot, but you can't foul on a three-point shot. So as much as I'd like to believe or like to say that it started on Josh Hart's missed free throw, it really started on out of the inbounds play. And here's the, here's the, the issue with, with Tibbs and his substitution. You shouldn't have a big guy on the floor at that time. Because if they want to throw it inside and score an easy two, you know, and you just put your hands up and they score an easy two, okay, they score an easy two. But by bringing a big guy in, he's going to be late on any switch. You run the risk of fouling a three-point shot. And then the same thing happened when they missed the first free throw. When they missed the first free throw, now it becomes potentially a three-point game or a two-point game when the Sixers get the ball back, Right? So you should have a sub ready to go if it's a three-point game, sub in whatever guard you want so you switch every screen. Instead, what did they, what did they do? They had Mitchell Robinson still in the game, and though he, he gets closer to the screen, he's playing in the drop, and Tyrese Maxey gets a wide-open step in three. Now, granted, you could sit here and tell me all you want that, hey, Deuce McBride should have fouled in the backcourt. That's fine. He should have fouled and he didn't. Hey, but whether he should foul or shouldn't foul, that shouldn't affect the fact that if you're up three points, hey, you want to be able to switch every screen and be right there with the switch. And yes, you could do it with Mitchell Robinson. That's fine. He could also be way up there high. Or you could just take your big guy out, switch everything again. They lay the ball in. You don't tie the game. So here's what it comes down to. You choked a free throw. You fouled on a three-point shot. You didn't sub in the right personnel. And then you still had a chance to win the game with the ball with your best player, and you don't have a timeout to call. Right? To advance the basketball game. I think they actually had a timeout to advance the basketball and try and get one last quality look. Instead, Jalen Brunson gets his shot blocked. And while we like to think that it was so devastating way to lose, should be pointed out the Knicks had a lead. I think they were up five or six in overtime before losing uh, by six in overtime. So it wasn't like they hung their hats and once they lost the game, once the game was tied in regulation, went to overtime, they shut it down for, for the winner. That's not what happened. But what a tough way to lose a basketball game, huh? Tough way to lose a game. Oy, oy, oy. And it's one of those things where if you live long enough, it's going to come back your way. It just happened with the 76ers. 76ers choked away a game they well should have won playing at home. Now the Knicks do the exact same thing. And here's the last part about it, which is interesting. You have um, a team in the na- in the league's biggest market, and you have an MVP in a Joel Embiid. And I'd be fascinated to see what the numbers were on the broadcast. Because as much as it was a great watch, it was a really good basketball game. A really good basketball game. And the garden is as electric as any sporting venue anywhere in the world. Last night, not an exception. So you have a big name head coach in Tom Thibodeau. You have everyone knows Jalen Brunson. And you have a superstar in terms of accomplishments and probably name recognition in Joel Embiid. It's not like Philadelphia is a small market, but the fact that it's not LeBron, it's not Durant, it's not Steph. I wonder if people watched. What a game. What a finish to a game. And it brings up the, okay, now all of a sudden the pressure shifts to Philadelphia. I mean, excuse me, to, to New York. Like now, now, like you kind of got to win in Philly. You don't want this thing to go seven, do you? You don't want to be a team. We know how we rake over the coals teams that have a three, one lead and then lose that three, one lead. Don't believe me. I give you doc rivers. Speaking of doc rivers. How about that performance last night? No, I did not see it coming. Matter of fact, on the, in the bonus podcast, I said to everybody, like, if you're going to bet, like this seems like a kind of easy one bucks in an elimination game, a four point dog at home without Giannis, without Lillard. And the only time they had won a game in the series was Lillard having 35 points in the first half of game one. It seemed too easy. And what's the old expression? Any time something's too good to be true, it is. 
So an amazing, uh, an amazing back-to-back doubleheader of games last night in the NBA. And I love Jay Stu's investment in this thing. You were emotionally invested in that deal. Hell yeah. Emotionally invested, Jay Stu. Yeah, I was. Or were you financially invested? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't bet on the game, but I did see many um, tweets out there that showed how many times Maxi traveled on one of his big threes. On the, the it's on the foul three. He shot faked and switched pivot feet and stepped under. It was a travel. It was a travel. It's one of my more um, amusing things to watch. I don't know if I I tapped into an algorithm on X, but um, there is a, a a site dedicated to exposing all the traveling in the NBA. Um, and then the guy will go onto a basketball court and mimic it. And he'll do like the six steps and then he'll show the exact same thing that the NBA player does. It's really funny. Yeah. I've, I've seen that as well. I've, I've seen that one as well. Uh, boy, we got a good show for you. By the way, here's uh, Sixers head coach, Nick nurse talking about Joel Embiid's performance. He can do those things. It just not didn't seem like that was gonna appear tonight, right? He obviously was was not feeling great. It was a tough game for him, very, you know, very difficult. But he he found a, he found a way to do that stuff. I mean, he can move his feet. He can block shots. He can strip the ball. We've we've all seen him do that when he's when he's super engaged and trying to get a stop. And it was it was good that he finally came up and was able to dig dig, dig down and do that. I, I like that's that that's pretty awesome actually. I think people are mis assessing. Embiid was a mess in terms of turning the ball over. He had nine turnovers, he's seven and nineteen from the floor. But he's a p- plus fourteen. The team was way better with him on the floor, and he made some big free throws late. Um, but I I love that. Like, can you play well or play? You know, can you win when you're not playing well? And that's the case with Joel Embiid. Obviously, Tyrese Maxey carried him offensively. He was spectacular. Forty six nine and five. Wow. What were you going to say there, um, uh, Sam? Obviously, Bobby Portis was a big reason why the Bucks won. Sure. Um, I can't remember who he did this gesture against, but he did the too small. Too small he, gesture, yeah. nice, nice little basket. But when you're scoring that much and it's one two-pointer, do you think that the too small celebrations is sort of ridiculous in that moment? Has it, re- has it reached dab status? <sighs> It's like smacking the floor. I mean, the dab is more like a personal celebration of yourself. You know, you're like a touch score to touchdown. I'm a dab. What is the, what is the too small? It's celebration? taunting another guy. Okay. Same with you know the slapping the floor isn't even that much of a taunt. I mean the well this the impetus of slapping the floor yeah was for Duke and it was their international that was their sign for like we got let's dig in let's get a right. stop. Right. It's like a stops. pump you up thing, but yes. the too small thing is more of like a personal. You know, if, uh, what was yes. it, uh, Wagner got called for pointing at a guy. Like, why wouldn't they call a, a foul for the too small? It's just generally accepted, I guess. I don't know. It's How like, about Body Portis is a plus 30? He was great. He was, was great. Unbelievable. Pat, so. Bev, Pat Bev was really good last night, too. Uh, Malik Beasley had, what was it, four threes? I mean, that game was, and Indiana was up eight at the end of the first quarter, and I was like, eh, I'm going to flip around, see what else is on. Come back, and now all of a sudden the Bucks had the lead at the half, and then the third quarter was just an avalanche. Yeah, it was a fork in the road. Oh, the car went one decision in one one direction. Yes, yes, completely. Yes, completely. 